Maybe not that. Maybe someone is trying to help you and you're not letting them in a closed door. Somebody's angry at a slam door. The guys on the bikes are going door to door. Uh oh, those guys, what do you do? They knock on the literal door of your house, but what door do they really want to enter? Do you avoid the encounter, embrace it? The metaphors are thick here, but questions must be asked. Is sin crouching at your door? Are you keeping watch over the doors of your lips? Do you have an open door policy? Are you a door of hope, a door of despair? A rotating door, a door to a closet full of secrets. Do you listen to the doors? If so, I recommend therapy. Has anyone ever opened the door for you? There's all kinds of meanings of that one, dig deep. Are you moving with the crowd through the wide open doors, or are you headed for the narrow door? Time is right at your door. Knock, and the door shall be open. There's all kinds of encounters through all kinds of doors with all kinds of meetings. It can be scary. I mean, what's on the other side? Where does the door lead? And perhaps the most critical question of them all, and you know, you've played the game. Let me see if I can get you to ask it right there, right where you sit, right in front of all those doors. Are you ready? Knock, knock. Who's there? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Thank you, <clears throat> Kim and Linda, and good morning. Good morning. Speaking of doors, if there is actually a fire, the door <laughs> is over there. Doors, anything Michael can do, I can do. Nah, as well, well but uh, not as good. I was thinking of this subject when I first heard that Michael was going to speak on it and the Lord keeps laying on my heart. We've got eight to nine doors to go through this morning, so I'd better be careful. If you can go to the next one, please, Kim. I've written a little teaser there. It says, keep some securely locked. Open with caution and know when to close them. Some are always open, but will permanently close one day. What does that mean? Well, maybe you can work that out as we go through. Doors are often used in the Bible, speaking metaphorically of an opportunity. And I'll put Ephesians 1 there. Thank you. I remember, Kim, that's once. Simply because I love it, and I'm going to start at the beginning of the Bible anyway, and go right through the Bible in 20 minutes, which isn't easy. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. God knew all about you before He created this world. That's mind-blowing, staggering, God's love. I could also call this message... Man's sin and God's remedy, but we'll stick to the door theme, the door of sin. The door of sin, Genesis 4, 7, you got the New King James up there, but I'll read it and then we'll go back and look at it. God is speaking to Cain and says, if you do, do well... Will not your countenance look up with confidence? And if you do not do well, sin or the sin offering lies or crouches at the door. And it's, or Satan or sin, desires for you that you should rule over it. A bit complicated that one, wasn't it? If you do well, God is not talking about good works here. If you do well, you know that I believe the story of Cain and Abel where Abel as a shepherd offered up the firstling of the flock or a firstborn lamb. Cain offered up what he produced out of tilling the ground. If you do well, if Cain had done well as Abel did well, he would have been alright. His countenance had fallen. And it goes on to say, if your countenance can look up with confidence... But if you do not do well, sin, or the sin offering, lies or crouches at the door. In the Hebrew language, sin and sin offering are the one and the same word. How then did Cain and Abel know to bring this offering to God? I believe Adam and Eve would have told them about the events in the garden. There was a door there, a door of opportunity. And I think Eve, if there was a door in the garden of Eden, it doesn't say anything about it, it would be one of those doors with a little chain on it. So you can just open the door a little bit and see who's there. And she must have opened that door and there was the serpent or Satan coming in to say don't bother about the bit, bit about eating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God didn't really mean that. God won't really kill you or make you die if you do that. 
And it says, I go to it, she took the chain off and of course Satan has an entrance way. And Satan is doing the same thing still to this day. And I'm sure Adam and Eve must have told their two sons about this tremendous event of how God dealt with them when they sinned and how he clothed them with tunic of skins. The Creator God could have spoken into existence uh, an evening gown, purple, coarse for Eve, and she would have been absolutely beautiful. But I don't think he did it that way. He would have killed an animal and shed the blood of that animal to fashion these tunics made from animal skin. Probably upset all the animal liberation or something terrible at the time, except there wasn't any around. And so they would have talked this over with their two sons about how God provided a remedy for their failure. They tried to do it in man's way with fig leaves and it didn't work. But God took an animal and shed blood. We've already sung about blood this morning. And that in itself was a type of Christ. And so here they come, two young men, 25, probably 28 years of age. And Abel offered up the first thing or the firstborn which was acceptable to God because it was after his pattern. It was a spiritual offering. It spoke of God. It spoke of the need for forgiveness. And God was pleased with it. And Cain's offering, well, in itself it was right. He had to toil in the garden and produce all these crops, and he brought his best. But in Hebrews we read that Abel offered it by faith, and Abel's offering was more favourable or more excellent than Cain's. And so there's a picture there of the blood that was shed, a pointer all the way to the time of Calvary's cross when Jesus shed his blood. Cain though had a opportunity because the sin offering was also at the door. Yes, Satan was there with the temptation to sin at the door. And he's still there today in our lives trying to get in and get that false message across. But there was a sin offering. Cain could have gone out still and offered a sin offering. And he wouldn't have yielded to the temptation that Satan put in front of him. Because he went out full of jealousy and murdered his brother Abel. Meryl Unger said Cain had the opportunity still of offering a first thing of the flock involving the shedding of blood which points to Christ and his shed blood. But Cain took no notice of the Lord's warning and the result was the murder of his brother. Any wrongdoing is sin, not just murder. Jude 11 speaks of it, says, Woe to them for they've gone in the way of Cain. And verse 10 speaks of those who go by what they know naturally. And this is what Cain did. Cain is the type of a religious man. He has some belief in, his, in God, but he wants to do things and do his religious duties after his own will rather than after God's will. Proverbs says, There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death, not just physical death, but spiritual death. We need to be sure to do things God's way. Matthew Henry said the offering to Cain and Abel were different. Cain showed a proud, unbelieving heart. Therefore he and his offering were rejected. Abel came as a sinner and according to God's appointment by his sacrifice, expressing humility, sincerity and believing obedience, thus seeking the benefit of the new covenant of mercy through the promised seed, which is Christ. His sacrifice had a token that God accepted. Abel offered in faith. And Cain did not. We go to the next one, which is the door of safety and security in time of divine judgment. And it comes from Genesis 7, 16. It's Noah and the ark and the flood. And in Genesis 7, 16, it says, And the Lord shut him in, Noah, his wife, and his three sons, no one else. And the door was set in the side of the ark. God is in absolute control. We've mentioned the sovereignty of God this morning and how so often it is hard to understand. The two things go hand in hand here and that is man's responsibility and God's sovereignty. Sovereignty, and that's how it's been throughout history. 
Hebrews 11.7 tells us that Noah was warned by God of things not yet seen, and was moved of godly fear and built the ark, saving his family, and is called a preacher of righteousness in 2 Peter 2.5. And he would have warned sinful men of the imminent danger of this flood that was coming, something they knew nothing about, they would never seen heavy rain before. And God always gives an opportunity for man to repent of sin. It was 40 days of rain, and in that 40 days of rain, the ark started to, flip, started to lift off the ground. Imagine Noah building that ark and the ridicule he copped. Mrs. Noah, we don't know her name, but probably copped it. So the lady could have said to her, but we've had you around for a meal. We've looked after you. Someone else could have said, but why fix your computer for you, Noah? Let me into the ark. And you can just imagine the picture, and there's been movies made of it. But Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and he would have continued preaching and preaching and warning of the danger to come if mankind didn't repent because of the wickedness that was in the world. But they would not until, and even after, it was too late because the Lord shut the door. Man cannot do it. But God alone has that right. He determines. And he is perfectly just always in what he determines. The ark is seen as a type of Christ in salvation. I see it, tend to see it more as a sign of the safety and security for God's people in times of divine judgment. I mentioned last time of a multitude that cannot be numbered out of every tribe and tongue and nation. They have lost their life during a time of great tribulation yet to come. And once again in that period there will be a group of Jewish believers returned to the whole land that God promised them and they were brought through alive to go into God the reign of Christ on earth. It's a sign of divine safety in a time of divine judgment and the wrath of Satan. But yes, the ark does speak of Christ on entering in by the door, which we'll be looking at very shortly. Number three, Jesus Christ is the only door of salvation. And as we've already alluded to, John 10 Jesus, the good shepherd, is speaking about his sheep. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and go out and find pasture. And this is a wonderful verse of Jesus, who was that good shepherd who was sitting in the door of the sheepfold. If you enter through him, through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, he is the only means of salvation and forgiveness of sin. He is the one who said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I spent an hour on a phone of a Christian recently, and he wanted me to read a book on by a psychiatrist about getting rid of neg negativity and how it will help you with your pain. The trouble was he had a cult following I believe in letting go of negativity, it's good for you. But the next morning I looked at one of his videos. <clears throat> it was on YouTube and he said, don't worry about sin and hell or any of that stuff. You can either be a Buddha Christian or a Christian Buddha. No, no, you can't. You have to enter in by Jesus, the one who is the door for salvation. And that same man told me that he put his Bible away in the cupboard because of all these different translations <coughs> contradicting each other. Well, they don't. Some are better than others, maybe. But how sad to see that Satan comes in after man's thinking, the way of Cain, and people are deceived by it, and we need to be on our guard against it. Yeah, the next one, please. There is one other one we won't, won't do there, but that's in Luke 13. Someone said, but not many, to the Lord, not many people are being saved. And he said, strive to enter by the narrow door, the narrow gate. <coughs> the open door of Jesus' tomb. 
We are all very well aware of it after Easter. It says, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. The open door of the tomb is the guarantee of assurance that we have, having put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that the door of heaven will be open to us. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15, 23 says, But eat one, each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who are his at his coming. What a difference that open door of the tomb made to the disciples. At one stage they all fled and no longer followed him. Peter denied him three times. But after they saw and spent that 40 days and 40 nights of the risen and resurrected Lord, they were victorious and they marched triumphantly towards their own loss of life that they gave for the sake of the faith. A tremendous transformation and we too can be transformed and have that act complete and absolute assurance again that the door of heaven will be open to us. Not because of anything that we had done but because of the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. By the door of speech. Thank you. Now this is one where a door that you can open, but do you know when to shut it? If I preach until midday, I might be told to shut up in future. And rightly so. The door of speech, Psalm 141, 3 to 4. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline mine heart to any evil thing to practice wicked works. Paul often speaks about the doors of ministry. I'm not going to say much about this. Michael covered that world in many different areas in the series he did on it. But we have doors and opportunities to use our speech to spread the message of salvation and the truth of God's word. I spoke to an orthopedic surgeon during the week and I was able to talk to him about the Lord and how he helps you through pain. Norma and I spoke to a lady in South Africa who was just a secular poor, I had to do some business. You know the phone on speakerphone and it turns out she was a Christian because I changed the subject to the things of the Lord. She laughed at all my jokes so she was obviously a sensible and you know, intellectual lady. <laughs> but then I talk, turned the conversation to the things of the Lord and she was rejoicing and overjoyed because here was someone she could talk to about the Lord. She just lost a father who had died and her father was a pastor of her church and he'd been a volunteer pastor and she was grieving for him. And so we're just able to spend a bit of time and encourage her about the joyful reunion she would soon have with her Father in heaven. Let us seize the opportunities and use them. James 3, we could look at it but won't. It begins with a warning to teachers and preachers that they'll have to give a stricter account or a stricter judgment. It speaks about how we use our tongues. We can use it to praise the Lord, and yet sometimes we use it for cursing men and so forth. Then in Jeremiah 1, Jeremiah says to God, But I'm too young to be used by you to speak, Lord. But the Lord said to him, No, you know, I'll put my words in your mouth. And later on in chapter 20, it says, His word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back and I could not. What a good state to be in and we all like that. The Word of God effervescently bubbling up within us. Just longing to share it with those around us. The door of speech. Let's go to the next one because time is rapidly running out. Jesus is the judge standing at the door. Sounds like imminent judgment of sinners and yet it's addressed to believers. And it's speaking not about hell, hell or any other, heaven or hell, but rather the judgment seat of Christ. And it tells them to be patient until they're waiting in the Lord. And then it says, do not grumble about one another. See, so I can preach until midday and no one will grumble, will they? You'll be on your own in the church, but oh, okay. does everybody want to left? No, Norm will still be here. Good on you, Norm. But we do have that habit, don't we, sometimes of grumbling. 
But we have to give an account of ourselves at the judgment seat of Christ. It's not about salvation, that's forever secured with the shed blood of Christ, but we'll give an account of our life of service. And we'll receive rewards depending on what we've done. Have we done things of gold, silver, and precious stones? Or would it, will it be the wood, hay, and stubble which will burn up and be meaningless? I'm not interested in rewards, really. It doesn't motivate me, but seeing Jesus face to face does. The next one is Jesus knocking at the door of your heart, I've called him. It's from Revelation 3.20, which of course is addressed to the church of Laodicea. If that church had been in the right state, Jesus would have been in the midst because he said, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. But there was apostasy in the church of Laodicea and they needed to put things right. He was knocking at the door of that church, but he knocks at the door of the hearts of all men. And if only we will respond and allow him in, we'll have that time, an amazing time of communion and fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ who loved us and died for us on the cross of Calvary. Next one, the eternal door. Revelation 4.1 is John on the Isle of Patmos. The only disciple not to lose his life for the sake of his faith as far as we know. It says, and after these things I look and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice that I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here. There's a beautiful picture of heaven. And he was caught up there to be told things that must happen thereafter. And that's the book of Revelation. And all of that is very serious stuff. But this morning I'm just thinking of that. The door in heaven is open, awaiting each person who believes and has their trust and faith in Jesus Christ. And those words will ring up soon when the Lord returns at the rapture. Come up here, the assembling shout of 1 Thessalonians 4. What a glorious day that is going to be. But when heaven's door is finally shut, which side of the door will you be on? It's a serious question. Revelation 22, verses 14 to 15. Blessed are those who do his commandments, or wash their robes is possibly a bit more accurate translation, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates or the doors into the city. Those two words used interchangeably. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Israel Folau said something about that, didn't he? Quoting directly from the Bible. He was asked a question and he answered with the word of God and look at the fuss that it's caused. But the time will come when the door of heaven will be eternally closed. I trust our faith is in Jesus Christ. I close with three questions. Is Jesus Christ not only your Saviour, but is he the Lord of your life? Be sure, be very sure. Many people come to churches, good social life, or whatever the reason may be, but make sure you've had that transaction of Jesus Christ confessing your sin and inviting Jesus Christ to be your Saviour and Lord of your life. The second one, when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, will you receive rewards or suffer loss of rewards? There is no chance of losing your salvation, none, whatever. Jesus said, no one can snatch my sheep out of my hands. My Father is greater than I. No one can snatch them out of his hands. But we could face the possibility of losing rewards in heaven. And the final one, what will you do for Jesus this week? Quick tip. Do it quickly because he might come before this week is out. <coughs> what will you do for Jesus this week? What will we all do? Let us open the door of our mouth. Let the gospel go out in whatever way we can to those around us. Because we long to see them with us eternally in the presence of the loving Saviour. Father, we just thank you.
for a brief opportunity just to look at these different doors and the opportunities. I just pray, Father, that each one here will know of absolute assurance that they will spend eternity in the presence of a loving Saviour. Guide and direct us as we go out, we pray. Give us the doors or opportunities to share this message of love with those around us. We ask your blessing upon us now. In Jesus' worthy and precious name. Amen.